Welcome to the fourth lecture in the series Introduction to New Testament Textual, Criti Textual Criticism. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, your commandments are pure. They enlighten the eyes. Guide us today as we consider how your word was taken to many places in the ancient world, how it was expressed in different languages, to shine your light to those who walked in darkness. Shine your light upon us, so that we may be reflected upon everyone around us. In Jesus' name, Amen. In the early 1900s, scholar Alexander Souter wrote, The history of the New Testament text cannot be understood without a knowledge of the history of the Church. Part of that history is the history of the early translations of the New Testament text. Today, we are taking a closer look at some of the early versions of the New Testament, especially early translations of the Gospels. This involves mainly the study of early translations into Latin, Coptic, and Syriac, but there are other important versions of the New Testament too. The Old Latin, also called the Vitas Latina, is probably first referenced in a composition called the Acts of the Skeleton Martyrs from around the year 180. It uh, represents a transcript of a trial during a persecution in the city of Carthage. Saturninus the governor says to the defendant, What sort of things do you have in that case of yours? And Sporadus, the Christian, says, Books and letters of Paul, a righteous man. Now, when I refer to the old Latin, that, I don't want to get the wrong idea. There, there are different Latin transmission lines, the African, the European, the Italian, and Spanish. And uh, one of the questions to, ex to explore when, ex when studying the Old Latin uh, versions is, do they go back to one Latin text? Do they go back to one Greek text? Uh, at some points, like in Mark, Mark 9.15, they seem to all echo the same base text. And uh, by the way, when I say the African Old Latin, I'm not referring it to the, the whole continent of Africa, but to the Roman province of, of North Africa. Now, um, we can consider how do the Old Latin uh, witnesses translate once used Greek words. If, they, if we have a group of, of Old Latin witnesses and they all translate a once used Greek word the same way, that might indicate a relationship between them or among them. Now, the earliest Latin Gospels texts tend to be Western. And, and here I will uh, introduce the, uh, very briefly, just a little bit about the concept of text types. Uh, the Western text tends to be tweaked to increase clarity in a particular way, like the text of the Gospels and Acts in Codex Beze, Codex D. The Byzantine text, uh, that, that represents a text that was in dominant use in the vicinity of Byzantium, or Constantinople, thus the name. And um, the Alexandrian text tends to agree with the text of Codex Vaticanus and its allies. The Caesarean text is a text of the Gospels, which uh, agrees with the text of Family One, more or less. In witnesses with the Western form of the text, the Gospels often appear in the order Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark. Now, uh, there's a possibility that some of the Old Latins are closely related to each other, in different text lines, but by the late 300s, uh, two prominent writers, Jerome and Augustine, uh, mentioned that there were a great variety of, La of Latin texts. It seemed like just anybody that thought they could, could handle making a translation did so. So, uh, so by the late, late 400s, uh, J Jerome and some other helpers had, had finished making the Vulgate. And uh, it, it, had, it took some time before the Vulgate dominated the, the other Latin versions. Uh, Gregory the Great, uh, who, was, who was a bishop in Rome from 590 to 604, was still referring to the Vulgate as the new version. When we think of the Vulgate, there again, it's not as if we can pick up any Vulgate manuscript and expect to see every reading that Jerome adopted. Some of the old Latin readings were mixed into Vulgate texts. Also, there were later revisions in the days of Char Charlemagne, uh, Alcuin, and, and Theodolf, the Theodolf, and uh, other revisions came along even later. Now, the, uh, the representation of Old Latin witnesses can be a, a little complicated. There's an old way of identifying Latin witnesses, in which witnesses are represented by lowercase letters, lowercase 
uh, letters with superscriptive numerals and by short abbreviations, all, again, all in lowercase. There's also, though, a new identification method which uses the, the Buron numbers. I don't hold me to that pronunciation. Uh, B-E-U-R-O-N numbers, so-called because this method was developed by members of the Vetus Latina Institute in Europe. The uh, Gospels manuscripts have numbers 1 through 49. Acts and the general epistles in Revelation have numbers 50 through 74. The Pauline epistles have numbers 75 through 99. Now, uh, a lot of old Latin witnesses are only partly old Latin, side by side with, with Vulgate texts. And when looking into the old Latin witnesses, um, the production dates sometimes don't mean as much as you might think. A manuscript might be fairly recent, but still have an old Latin text from before, from before the time when Jerome made the Vulgate, which was in the late, late, late 300s. Now let's turn to the Coptic version. And again, we have several dis different transmission lines in several, in, in, in several different, different dialects. So, uh, the first of the seven is the uh, Sahidic uh, version. We have uh, some early representatives of this version at Bar Barcelona. Uh, and these are, tend to be, have, have, have a text that tends to be Alexandrian. Um, there's some Western readings mix, mixed in there. But the earliest layer of, of the Sahidic text looks very, very Alexandrian. Uh, in Acts 27.37, there's a rare agreement with B regarding the number of souls on board the ship. And this suggests a close relationship between B and the earliest layer of the Sahidic version. Also in Codex T, uh, we see Sahidic and Greek side by side, so, that, so we see a, a historic connection there. But we also see that the Western text was also in Egypt. Uh, in the manuscript, uh, the Coptic manuscript, G67, we have the Book of Acts in Middle Egyptian. And in Middle Egyptian, there are basically three manuscripts that are the, 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 the main witnesses for Middle Egyptian. G67, uh, Codex Shoen uh, 2650, and the Shredder Codex. Uh, which is, and, and of course, two of those are just the Gospel of Matthew. Now, um, then there is the Lycopolitan uh, dialect, represented by the Qua Codex, which is very early as, as Sahidic witnesses go, uh, back to the 300s. There's also the proto baharic This is represented by P P Pyrus Bodmer III, again from the 300s, which includes the Gospel of John. It is Alexandrian. It has an unusual treatment of sacred names in John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.18. Then there's the Baharic, and uh, this is represented by later manuscripts, especially by Huntington Manuscript 17, which was made in 1174. Then there's the Akmimic uh, version, and this is incomplete. Uh, we don't have the whole New Testament for this version by, by a long shot. And likewise, the Fayumic version, and this too is, is fragmentary. So those seven dialects all follow, fall under the category of Coptic versions. Then there's the Syriac version. And again, it's not just one version, it's versions. Starting with Tatian's Diatessaron, which was a combination blended together of all four Gospels into one continuous account. And in Syria, this appears to have been the dominant Gospels-based text until the Peshitta emerged, which is probably in the late 300s. Now, the Diatessera did not have the genealogies, but uh, the, the Syriac writer Afrahat uh, wrote in the 330s, and it appears that he not only had the uh, Diatessera, but he also had something else, an, another text of the Gospels that had the genealogies. Now, there's the Old Syriac. We don't have very many uh, witnesses to the Old Syriac text. Two of them that we do have are the Sinaitic Syriac manuscript and the Curatonian Syriac manuscript. Also, at St. Catherine's Monastery, a Syriac number 37. Besides the old Syriac, there is the Peshitta, and we have no, dozens and dozens of copies of the Peshitta. And its text type uh, is usually like the Byzantine text. But in the earliest layer of the Peshitta, we don't have the books of 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, or our Revelation. Now, some Peshitta manuscripts are more significant than others. Again, you can't just pick up every Peshitta manuscript and expect to see exactly the same thing. They are very uniform, but uh, Codex Phillips 1388, a British Library Additional Manuscript 14470, and the Rabuli Gospels are especially significant. Now, the Peshitta manuscript, as I mentioned, usually agrees with the Byzantine text, uh, 
Later on came the Philoxenian edition of the Peshitta, which includes the books that are not in the original layer. Then comes the Harklian Syriac, which echoes a, dist a distinct ancient Greek text in the general epistles. The Harklian Syriac is extremely literal, and it also has a, a limited apparatus. It mentions a lot of, of alternative readings. There is also the Palestinian Aramaic, and this used to be uh, categorized as a Syriac version, but I think folks are trying to say, no, this is Aramaic, it's not quite the same dialect. And this, the Palestinian Aramaic is mainly extant in lectionaries. Uh, one interesting thing about it is that it has the story of the adulteress at the end of the Gospel of John. Also, there are some other, other versions that uh, need to be mentioned. The Gothic version is practically extinct, but we have one main witness to the Gospels in Gothic, and that is Codex Argentius. Now, the Gothic version, uh, from historical records, uh, was made by Wolfius, uh, Wolfius and, who was an Arian. And uh, one question about this version is, was he an Arian when he did the translation work? And we can't really tell uh, one way or the other from, from the work that he did. Then there is the Armenian and the Georgian versions. Armenia was the first Christian nation, even before Constantine uh, called the Council of Nicaea, Armenia was already Christian earlier in the 300s. About a hundred years later, a Mesrop made the Armenian alphabet and translated the Bible into Armenian. Now, this first attempt is thought to have been based on a Syriac text, possibly with some Diatessaron influence. And this first edition was finished about the year 411. But later on in, in the 430s, uh, some of Mesrop's assistants uh, were, were traveling. And in Constantinople, they found a codex and brought it back to Armenia. And based on that Greek codex, they made a revision of the Armenian text. Also, there is a, a, the, the Georgian text was then based off of the Armenian. Now, when it comes to Armenian manuscripts, aside from a few fragments, uh, a manuscript from the 800s or from the 900s, for an Armenian manuscript, that is old. And again, you have to keep in mind, there's not just one Armenian text. There were, there were revisions later on. Especially in Cilician Armenia, the text was revised toward the Byzantine text by Nurses of Lambron, and also uh, toward the Vulgate. It kind of depended on who the Armenians wanted to be allied with in the West. Now, there are different kinds of script used for writing Armenian. The Urkata gear, which is called the, the iron letters, the old, the old, the old kind. The bowler gear, which are rounder and smaller. The natur gear, which is kind of cursive in later manuscripts. And the skaha gear, which is modern slanted cursive. Now, the older an Armenian Gospels manuscript is, the more it appears to be based on a text that was like the text of Family One. And the same is true of old Georgian Gospels manuscripts' textual character. Georgian was translated from Armenian, and so that connection makes sense. But some Georgian witnesses are older than most Armenian witnesses. The oldest substantial Gospels manuscript in Georgia would be the Adish manuscript, and again, there are some exceptions, but these are the main ones, the oldest substantial Gospels. It's the Adish manuscript from 897, which is not that old, but it's an echo of an older voice. Now, the old Georgian goes back to the 400s, along with the Armenian. Uh, later on, though, George of Athos, in the early well, well, 1000s, uh, made a revision of the Gospels in Georgian, and his revision, uh, based on a Greek text, made the Georgian text more Byzantine. Also, it's important to keep in mind when studying the Armenian and the Georgian versions, Revelation may have an entirely different kind of base text than the rest. So don't assume that Revelation has the same God transmissions history as the Gospels. Now, Armenian and Georgian copyists went all over the place. Egypt, Jerusalem, uh, they're not just in Armenia and Georgia. Uh, sometimes you might find an Armenian manuscript that has a very unusual reading, and that might have been acquired from the particular locale that that manuscript was, where that manuscript was made. There's also the Ethiopic version, known as Gies. The Christianity was in Ethiopia in the early 300s, and Chrysostom, uh, working in, in Constantinople, in the 380s, mentioned that the Gospel of John had been translated into Ethiopic. Uh, all indications are that the Ethiopic version is not a secondary version like, like the Georgian, but was translated directly from Greek.
uh, every time we look at the Ethiopic version, it seems like it gets a little bit more important. The Garima Gospels, which used to be dated in the 1000s, have been carbon dated to the 500s. And the Garima Gospels are not just a bare text kind of manuscript. They're rather fancy. They have the Eusebian canons, they have illustrations. And most Ethiopic manuscripts are from the 300s or later. And its text tends to match up with the Peshitta. It's mainly Byzantine, but the Ethiopic text does not have the Pericope Adultery. There are over 500 Ethiopic New Testament manuscripts. The Gospel of John seems somewhat less Byzantine than the other books. Also to consider is the Arabic version. And again, it seems to, it seems to get more important every time we look at it. The first layer of the Arabic version is probably from the 600s or possibly even earlier. There was a town in, in, in southern Arabia called Najran. It's, it's still there. Uh, it was a, a Christian center, though, in the 400s. Different groups of Arabic manuscripts have families which have different ancestors. Some are based on the Peshitta, but others are based on Greek. The uh, manuscript, uh, Uncial Manuscript uh, 0137 is a Greek and Arabic diglot. It's a, a fragment of Matthew. Also, what used to be called Sinai Arabic Manuscripts 8 and 28 are really one manuscript, which is known as Codex Sinaiticus Arabicus, or CSA. There are different families of Arabic manuscripts, and families A and C both echo Greek text, and they both seem more than 70% Byzantine. Family B uh, has an interesting connection to the Alexandrian text, even though it's not, not purely Alexandrian by a long shot, but in Luke 16:19. It mentions the name of the rich man in the, in the parable of, of the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man's name is given as Nineveh. And that corresponds, sort of, to a reading found way back in Papyrus 75. Now, um, there's another version called the Old Church Slavonic from the 800s. There was, and this comes to us in, in two different alphabets. There's the Glagolithic alphabet and the Cyrillic alphabet. There's another version, which, like the Gothic, is almost extinct, called Nubian. And uh, this is uh, from, 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 from a south, south, well, southeast uh, Africa, in, in the sense of, you know, relative to the Roman Empire, in the area of Ethiopia and Sudan. In Nubian, we have a Christmas time lectionary, and we have an assortment of inscriptions in Nubian. At some point, there was a Nubian New Testament out there, at least a substantial part of it. There's also a version called Caucasian Albanian, and for all practical purposes, this text practically is extinct, although it's not quite, quite there. It was among the new finds found at St. Catherine's Monastery. Now, uh, let's consider some takeaways uh, from this review. First, early versions can be extremely valuable to track the scope of readings and groups of readings. To, to answer the question, what was the early range of rival readings? Was this particular reading limited to one locale? Or did we see this reading all over the place? That's part of why studying versions is important. The second takeaway is that early versions shouldn't be asked to do things they can't do. Sometimes articles aren't transferable. Sometimes word order can't, word order can't be expected to reflect the Greek word order. Some languages don't have exact parallels for the nuances of Greek. Takeaway number three, early versions should be considered with an awareness of stages in their histories. If you pick up a, a Vulgate manuscript of a certain revision, don't expect it to be just like a manuscript that's 300 years earlier. Early versions testimonies should generally be boiled down to reflect the history of the text of the version keeping in mind when and where the virginal text was revised in cases where this can be observed. And takeaway number four, early versions should generally be, generally be separated into Gospels, Acts, Pauline Epistles, General Epistles, and Revelation. Sometimes we don't even have a part of one of these. So all of these things need to be considered when studying the early versions of the New Testament. Thank you.